Hey hey, this is Alex Miller, aka Carney7 for UpswingPoker.com and this is going to be the fourth video of some free content I'm putting out in advance of my No Limit Holland 6 Max course which is coming out later this month. So this video is going to be about probing the turn and in particular it's going to be about the process that I went through in making my course video about probing the turn. So if you're interested in buying the course then hopefully this is going to give you a really good understanding of what's been put into the videos in the course and therefore what you can expect the quality of the output to be. And if you're not interested in buying the course, perhaps it's out of your price range, then don't worry, still watch this video because I'm gonna go through a bunch of stuff on turn probing and you're hopefully gonna get, first of all, a good idea of what you should be doing when you're probing the turn, but also what sort of work you could do on your own solvers in order to understand the spot and play it well. So yeah, hopefully it'll be useful all around. At the end of the video, I'm going to go over the overall structure of my course as well, so you can see what sort of videos you're going to find in the course and therefore whether or not it's going to be useful for you. So let's get right into it. So the first thing that I'm gonna to want to do when I've decided to make a video on turn probing is to list everything that is going to have to be done in order to make this video good. So in this place, which is where I uh, cite that I use to and uh, plan projects and stuff. So I've got turn probes here. It's the video we're, we're on. And we've got a bunch of subtasks here. So first I need to read through and make notes on my old notes on this topic. And then I've got um, other things, look at imposition strategies versus a probe bet and make notes on betting strategies and so on. So I've got a bunch of things that I'm going to want to do before I can say I'm ready to make this video. And first of all, I probably will go with uh, looking at the, uh, the previous notes that I've got on the on the topic. So if I bring those into the screen here, um, so this would be this is something that I wrote with someone else. Um, here we go. This is a turn probing part of it. As our position after flop goes check check. So yeah, I got a um, private solver, a different one from this before Pio Solver and all the rest came out. And me and someone else wrote hundreds of thousands of words on all sorts of different topics from sort of taking a small number of solver spots and extrapolating to try and understand what's going on. So so here we have about 11 pages or so of notes on um, turn probing, which is, believe it or not, a very small amount compared to some other spots where we've got like um, 40 pages or something. But, um, but yeah, so th that's, first of all, I'll read through that and I'll make key notes from it so that I don't forget anything that I used to know, if you like, any of the really important stuff but then once I've made those notes, I'll kind of forget about that for a while and start from scratch and go on to this new solver where we have a ton more information than I used to be able to get out of the old solver. So we should be able to get some better results. So we go into going to this solver and we filtered here for the spot where we are about to turn probe. This is big blind versus button. So the button has checked back the flop in a single race pot and we want to probe the turn 31% of the time. We're checking here 69% and betting 31%. And we're betting a really wide range of different sizings, depends on what the board is and so on. So we're gonna to have to try and take this information, which is obviously a mess at the moment. There's just a ton of information there. And we're gonna to have to boil this down somehow into a workable strategy that people are going to be able to play with and actually implement at the tables when they've watched this video. So so how do we do that? Well, first of all, I'll start by filtering for ace high flops. So here we've seen that the check frequency has gone up, so up 76% of the time. Now we're only going to be probing 24% of the time on ace high flops. So our frequency has gone down there. But Things are changing still based on exactly what the board is, what the turn is, and so on. You know, what the flop is, what the turn is. It's not like we just want to bet 24% of the time on any after any ace high flop. So we're going to have to look into things in a bit more detail than this. So what I do is I export this spreadsheet thing you can see here into Excel. And that allows me to play around with it, with it a bit more. So here I've got a Excel spreadsheet titled Other Ace High. And it's titled that because I've taken out all the ones with two or more Broadway cards and studied those in a separate spreadsheet. So this particular spreadsheet, we're looking at these other ace high flops. And this tab here that you can see that we're on is blank turns. And I split that into three again. So we've got high blank turns here. And then below we've got some mid blank turns and here we've got some low blank turns. And you can see that with the high blank turns, we're actually only C betting an average of 14%, uh, only probing, sorry, an average of 14% of the time. So really getting even lower now when we've got a ace high flop and a high turn. 
and then betting a bit more often on the other ones. So if we've got a medium, admittedly with a small sample here, but if we've got a medium turn here, betting 18% of the time and with a low turn, 29% of the time. And then I'm also, uh, so these are these are just on blank turns. Then I've also got these other tabs. So if the turn is three flush or the turn pairs or uh, pairs the board or the turn brings a three straight or a four straight, then filter all those separately. And then I'm looking into each of these separate things and I'm going to start making notes on them. So here is a Word document where I will have been making notes. This uh, So here's two Broadway flops and here's other ace high flops. Um, so yeah, just making notes. Um, so here I've got on low turns, one sizing, etc, etc. So talking about sizing strategies that tend to be seeing and also the frequencies, how often we tend to be betting when we've really narrowed things down into something quite uh, straightforward. So, you know, we've got ace high flop and the turn is a low blank, for example, and making a note on how we should be playing them. So what's, uh, and then obviously after after doing this with ace high flops and doing it with king high flops and then queen to jack high flops. So I end up um, with this little folder for turn probing with a, a few different um, board types. So two, two plus Broadway, low flops, other ace high, other king high, etc. So So yeah, I've got all these Excel files. I've made all these notes, but obviously I can't just spew out this random selection of notes of how to play in all sorts of different scenarios. Just got long, long lists of, of notes of what's going on here. And that's not going to be something that you can just pass on to someone and they're going to be able to go away and actually play well uh, as a result of that. So we need to start getting things down into some sort of workable strategy. And I start that process by starting uh, this little section here, which titled frequencies. And what I'm doing here is uh, looking for what sort of after what sort of flops we can have a default of a low starting frequency and when I say low I mean about 20% of the time if um, if you're watching uh, if you end up watching the course then I have this thing called high mid low where I talk about different um, frequencies in terms of words rather than numbers because it's much easier to remember something's a high frequency rather than something's 80% and then uh, yeah, so, you know, if you're saying this is 80%, this is 77% and so on, by the time you've looked at a bunch of stuff, you forgot what everything is. So, yeah, it makes it easier to do in words. But, um, but yeah, so I've got these. After certain flops, it's going to be, you're going to have a default of betting a low frequency. And I do this a lot. So what I'm doing is I'm giving kind of a simple strategy. So if somebody wants to, um, I, I'm essentially giving the power to the viewer to say how much detail they want to go into when they're implementing their strategy. So they know here that if they see certain types of flops, they can be betting not very often low. And if, if it's after a different type of flop, then they get, they'll be able to bet a bit more often and so on. And then I go into the adjustments after that. So any adjustments that people want to remember or can remember, they can then say, okay, this is a, was a low flop, but then also a high turn. So I'm going to change my strategy in this way and so on. So we're getting somewhere now. We're starting to have some defaults and starting to have some adjustments from those defaults, but it's still quite a lot to remember. It's going to be very difficult for someone to remember all of these bullet points. Bear in mind, they're looking at all sorts of different uh, spots as well, not just turn probing. You've also got turn barreling and everything on the flop and so on. So yeah, going to be difficult just to go from this. So we need to get things, um, make things a little bit easier for people. So what I start doing then is bringing out the concepts that kind of drive all of the strategies that go on. So I'll be making notes on these in this decide overall betting strategies um, thing. So I'm going to start talking in the video by saying this is going to be at the start of the video. So it's kind of towards the end of my work, but will be presented at the start of the video. And I'll be saying our turn probing frequencies will be affected by a few factors. And the first factor is that our opponent tends to have an advantage in the ranges on higher flops and that carries through to the turn. So we'll tend to bet the turn less often after the flop was high. And then the next point I make is that the second, uh, the second factor is that our opponent tends to have more high cards in their range than we do after the flop checks through. So again, we tend to bet high turns less often than low turns. So now all of a sudden we have two heuristics that we can use that mean that when we've got a flop, and a turn, 
and we know the height of that flop and turn, we really have a good understanding of how often roughly we're going to want to be betting. If the flop is high and the turn is high as well, we're going to be betting not very often at all. If the flop is low and the turn is low, we're going to be betting as often as we're going to be betting. So already we're starting to build up a pretty decent picture of how we're going to be playing on different flop and turn combinations. I then go on to talk about how you need to adjust things based on whether there's uh, what kind of the principles behind why you adjust things based on whether there's a three straight or a three flush come out on the turn and so on. And with a relatively small number of concepts being brought in here, then I'm hoping that people are now at the stage where they really have a good understanding of the spot. And all they really need is the gaps to be filled in. You know, exactly how often do we want to bet on when, the, you know, when the flop is high and the turn is high, what counts as not betting very often. And when the flop is low and the turn is low, what counts as betting pretty often and so on. So... Now, when I'm going through all these bullet points and so on that we've set up in the uh, Word document we've just seen, then it's going to be like every single bullet point is going to be something that the viewer expects because they already understand what's going on and they're just kind of getting it reinforced and finding out more exactly what's happening. So I put things then into the, this frequency stuff, kind of uh, boil it down a little bit more into something a bit more manageable still than what was in the Word document. But then I will have this sort of um, PowerPoint presentation and turn probes after high flops. We've got a def default frequency of low, betting a bit more on lower turns, but less on higher turns, and then take our frequency up when there's a three flush turn, etc. etc. So, when I'm going through in the video, I'm going to be talking about all of these individual points and then linking them to the original concepts that I talked about at the start of the video. And hopefully, then this is going to be something that people are actually going to remember. And then at the end of this video, I actually end up saying, you know, if there's, if you just understand these small number of co concepts, like reiterate them, and you just remember like three things, um, you know, the default frequencies for each different type of flop, you'll, you'll be playing pretty well in this turn probing spot because you're going to be able to uh, adjust from your defaults and you'll know which way to uh, adjust. Even if you don't remember exactly how far to adjust, you're going to be doing things pretty much right because you understand what's going on. So this is what I've done. Uh, done all this for frequencies. Also going to do something similar for sizings. In this particular situation, I end up suggesting a two sizing strategy. I think this is a spot where if you just have a one sizing strategy, that's going to play right into people's hands and even sort of common mistakes that people might have. Again, they're going to um, they're going to get away with them and going to be doing well with uh, with common mistakes such as. You know, if there's some boards like the monotone boards that we've looked at in previous videos where people should be checking quite a lot of flushes rather than just see betting flushes all the time. If, for example, you just have one size of probing the turn of half pot or third pot or whatever it is, then your opponent isn't getting punished at all for, you know, you're not having any big sizings in there. So you really need a big sizing as well as a smaller sizing on when you're probing the turn. And in fact, it would be even better to have more than two sizings. But I decide to teach just two sizings because I think it gets a bit too complicated otherwise. So, so yeah, this is, um, so now I've built up all these uh, concepts and all of these uh, things that people um, can actually, you know, actual strategies that people can use. So, uh, yeah, so that then, uh, let me just check, not forgetting anything here. Um, yeah, I think we're, I think we're good. Um, yeah, so then we go back to our list of things that we want to cover and uh, close this overall betting strategies and we've got the other things that we want to be doing before we've got a completed or we're ready to start filming the video if you like so we're going to be uh, making well, we made the conclusions powerpoint we're going to be talking about exploitative stuff so common mistakes that people might make and how you want to be exploiting those and i'll probably for the umpteenth time in the course reiterate that there's no prizes for playing perfect gto if there's a way to exploit your opponent that will make you more money you should always take it don't um, don't just play GTO for the sake of it, if you like. You need to understand GTO and play it when there's no way to exploit. But then, um, yeah, if there is a way to exploit well, then obviously go for that. And then also look at probing versus earlier positions. So if the uh, the player is in the button, uh, in the cutoff, hijack or under the gun, in this case, it doesn't change things too much, fortunately. So that um, doesn't add too much extra work. But then, um, yeah, just want to make a note of that so that I've um, so people have some idea of what to do if, if the positions are slightly different. And then finally, and extremely importantly, I'll then be going through some examples of 
the um, the solver and specific. So I'll look at a specific flop and turn and look at how to build the ranges because it's all very well knowing oh, I need to bet like 35% of the time in this situation. But how do you build that 35%? Which hands go into the betting range? Which hands go into the checking range? Which hands are mixed strategies and so on? So I'll look through quite a few of these situations usually and then I'll pick a couple of the most sort of the ones that illustrate things the best, illustrate concepts the best, and I will uh, put those in the video and talk through, you know, how do we play our very strong hands? How do we play our hands a little bit below that? How do we play our middling hands? How do we play our bluffs? Is this a spot where we want to be betting with total air or do we always check our total air and so on? So all of these sort of things so that people are comfortable with actually putting a strategy together, not just in terms of knowing the overall strategy, but how individual hands go into the strategy. So yeah, that'll be it then after that. It'll be time to actually film the video and I've got to try and remember to look at the camera, uh, not just read my notes or anything and uh, manage the PowerPoints and solve the stuff on the screen and not say anything stupid. So uh, most of the time I do that okay, I think. But um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's tiring stuff, surprisingly. But yeah, so it's a long and complex process from that first sort of look at the solver to see, you know, what's going on in this spot and, um, you know, taking just that sort of initial messy strategy, like set of strategies on all sorts of different boards into something that is going to teach people how to actually play the spot. So they A, understand the spot, B, have a strategy which, you know, no matter what the flop or turn is, you know, some monotone flop and or flush turn or whatever, they, they, they still have an idea of what they're going to be doing. It's not like they just have to hope that any turn they face in a real game is similar to the example in the video because I've really gone through um, quite a complete overview of, of you know how the spot works. So now I'm going to look at over at the sort of overall course structure and what sort of things I'm going to be covering in the course. So I've brought up the course on the Upswing website here, and as you can see, it's split into four main sections. So we've got the first one is Cash Game Fundamentals. And this is just going to set you up really nicely for the rest of the course. I'm going to go through some theory that will hopefully help you to think about the game in a bit of a better way. And I'm going to be referring back to this like throughout the post-flop section. And you'll see that the stuff I'm talking about here really applies to many, many different spots. So yeah, I hope that section is going to be something that's definitely worth watching for everyone who buys the course. Then we have the pre-flop section where I've used some ranges from Manka Solver, and these ranges are worth hundreds of dollars on their own. So if you don't have sort of state-of-the-art preflop ranges yourself currently, then you're going to get full access to a bunch of ranges for 50 big blinds, 100 big blinds, and 200 big blinds. So it's going to be a huge amount of value for you just from this section of the course alone. Even if you do have good preflop ranges, I'd still say the videos are gonna be worth a watch. I'm gonna go through a bunch of the different preflop spots. Also gonna be talking about some game theory stuff and uh, things to watch out for and so on, different uh, concepts. So there's definitely some value there beyond just the ranges themselves. But particularly, like I say, if you don't have uh, really good preflop ranges at the moment, this is gonna be a hugely valuable section to you. Postflop is gonna be the main part of the course thing. And you can see here that we've got post flop split into four sections as well. So uh, four extra sections here. And the main, well, I say the main, the one I spent the most time on is imposition versus big blind. It's the, it's got the most videos here. It's the, uh, it's kind of the positional matchup that's the most common in, uh, in poker. So the most important. And if we expand the videos that you can expect to see in this part of the course, then you can see we've got videos on donking the flop, uh, on c-betting the flop on all sorts of different boards. Docking the flop is not something you want to do on most boards, but there is a certain board type where it is actually good. And then, like I say, so flop c-betting on lots of different types of boards and versus flop c-bet and then versus check raise. So going all the way to how often do you want to be three betting versus a check raise based on the c-bet size, the check raise size, and the um, board, the, the actual board you're on. And it turns out that there's one size that you want to use pretty much everywhere when you're three betting the flop, but the frequency does change a lot based on what the board is and what the sizings have been used so far. So we're we'll going through that there, but but yeah. So all of these uh, all of these videos, lots of detail on how to play on on different boards, and then we're going to do something similar for blind versus blind. Um, so here we've got. Uh, you know, C betting versus C bet, big blind versus check, and then small blind versus big blind bet. Um, so uh, a bunch of a bunch of videos here on how to flop play for small blind versus big blinds. Then we've also got uh, turn videos, 
And uh, here's where we see the probing the term that we've been talking about in this video. And to give an example of what you can expect to see when uh, watching one of these videos on the term, we've got the first uh, probing on the term part one is going to be about the overall strategies. So what sizings should you be using, what frequencies on different board types and so on. Um, if we open up part two, then you can see we've got a 28 and a half minute video or so here on hand selection examples. So the first one I look at here is an Ace King 8-4. And this part will really help you to kind of get a good picture of how to play individual hand types. So I'll be going through a relatively small number of examples, but in a lot of detail. And I'll be going through concepts as well. So I've really tried to pick examples where there are some useful concepts that you can then take and apply to other boards as well. So you don't just only know how to play hands on Ace King 8-4, but also on lots of other different different boards. So yeah, and then the final part three on probing the turn is just the exploitative stuff and also how to play against turn probes. So yeah, something very important to say is that the process that you've seen in the earlier part of this video, that's carried forward to all the other videos in this course. I haven't just you know, done this for a couple of videos and then a bunch of the videos are like, well, yeah, just see better bit here and you'll be all right. Don't worry about what the solver says here, etc. Every video has been through this rigorous process and I think the output should be really, really good. And I've also spent a long time making sure that stuff is implementable for people of all different abilities and also not all different abilities, I guess, because this is certainly an advanced course aimed at players who are at least pretty competent. But I want to cater to people who have all sorts of different abilities in terms of implementing complex strategies. Some people are quite happy to have very complex strategies and kind of balance lots of different ranges and be all right with that and, you know, make adjustments based on exactly what the board is and so on. Other people prefer to have just some sort of default where they're playing pretty well, particularly if they play in games with other weaker with weaker players or something, then they might not be so bothered about being exactly GTO in lots of spots and they might be wanting to just uh, focus more on exploitive stuff, but they still want a base strategy that's pretty good. So in all of these videos, I'm trying to give default strategies where if you just watch the video through quickly and take a few of the main points from it, you're going to be able to improve your play and have a pretty good strategy that's going to work along with one or two main adjustments that you remember. So to make sure that, you know, in this turn probing example, well, if the board's higher, I'm going to be betting less. If the board's lower, I'm going to be betting more, for example. So even if you don't remember everything in the videos, you're still going to have a pretty decent strategy that's going to work relatively well overall. But if you are wanting to really play extremely well, then I'm trying to give a lot of detail as well so that you can um, you, know, you can differentiate based on lots of different factors and and play a um, play really well. So so yeah, basically leaving it to the viewer to decide exactly how much complexity they want to add to their game, but making sure that all the information is there. So nobody's really watching it and thinking uh, that wasn't really detailed enough for me. I didn't really learn much there. So so yeah, then we've got uh, three bet pots. And finally, we've got play and explains. And play and explains, pretty self-explanatory. I w work on theory for a year and then just sit down and try and play the game of poker. Um, Surprisingly, it doesn't go too badly. So I think that's a really good sign that you're going to be able to, if you're actually playing, you're watching a section, implementing it into your game, playing a bunch and then watching another section and so on. I think you're going to be able to bring stuff into your game really well and it's going to work pretty well because I was able to do it at least to a reasonable degree, obviously with some mistakes, but to a reasonable degree when I've not been, you know, doing all the playing in between that, that I would be if I was not just making a course, if I was actually doing this for my own benefit. So, so yeah, that's going to be it. Hopefully this gives you a pretty good idea of what the course contains and the sort of level of preparation and output that you're going to get if you buy the course. The course is going to be on sale this month and it's going to be priced at $999. If you buy the course in the first week of its release, you're also going to get another course for free. This course is not going to be free after the first week. And in a video next week, it's coming out on the 10th of January, I'm going to talk in more detail about this extra course. And this is something that you definitely want to look out for, particularly if you're a high stakes player. This is going to be absolutely insane value in this extra course, even much more value than I expected it would be when I started to make it. But it's turned out, I think, um, well, you'll see if you watch the video next week, but hopefully things will become clear then. But yeah, that's going to be it for this week. But I shall hopefully see you next week for that. And Thank you for watching.